Well, good morning and welcome to Cadabra's weekly webinar. It's been several weeks since we did this webinar and we've been busy trying to get Form 04.1 done and that's the, one of the main reasons why we have uh, had a bit of a, um, a lapse in our webinars this, uh, this last month. Um, but I want to say, I hope you're all um, enjoying the, the fall, the, the spring leaves of, of your trees near you. We got an oak tree here in our picture. I, I, I don't know what this means regarding validation, but um, it's a nice picture. Uh, I want to welcome Joanne Tondon to, uh, to our webinar. She has actually been instrumental in putting the webinar together. So the slides, um, the, the demos today, um, we're going to be switching. She's going to be doing the demo. I'm going to say a few things about what we're doing, and then I'm going to switch it over to her. Um, so, Joanna, hello. Can you hear me okay? Hello, Patrick. I can hear you fine. Hey. Hello. <laughs> Great to have you here. Um, and we are recording, so we'll be putting this on YouTube later today. So today's webinar, um, we are talking about validation. We've had uh, several requests to add validation to two forms here now for many years, and I'm really happy to say that we have it in 4.1. We have another webinar coming probably next week on some other features, but this week's webinar is totally dedicated to validation. So first, let's review the types of rules that we can have in our forms. We've got, we've got three types, and you see this on the left here. When you add a new rule, you can add a validation rule, you can add a formatting rule, and you can add an action rule. Traditionally, uh, validation rules have been less frequently used than the other two. So there's, most forms have action rules and formatting rules. I would say, just based on experiencing or looking at thousands of forms over the years, that probably 20% of the forms might have a validation rule. Uh, it might have been even less than that. Uh, when you add a validation rule, you're going to be matching a pattern. So the same condition could be used with a conditional formatting rule, which is the second one here. I should just say formatting. Um, and for that reason, we decided to to not support validation up until now because we could just easily work around by adding, converting that validation rule into a formatting rule. Um, now, the formatting rule does require, of course, adding uh, formatting and a few other things. Um, so now we have better support, and I'm going to be uh, showing that in a minute. But uh, formatting rules uh, were, the, were the backup, and formatting rules allow you to hide and show things. Uh, it also allow you to change the, the color of the background. Um, so if you want to highlight something that's not filled in. Uh, action rules are really there to do something. Set of fields value, query a data source, switch to a different view, those kinds of things. So once again, the validation rules, the main point was to validate the data, the format of the data. You know, is it an email? Is it a phone number? Those kinds of validation rules. Um, and like I said, formatting rules could have been used as a, a workaround in 3.2, and, and we did do that. Actually, we changed the validation rules for forms, but it required some manual intervention. Didn't take a lot of time, but it was still, a, you know, it was still a, a barrier to using Forms Viewer. Um, so what we're doing in 4. Point, and let me just kind of give you an example of what we used to do in 3.2. Uh, up until now, we've had a Forms Viewer sample form which you can download, it has validation in it. But here we see the expense report. In the expense report, you can see we're highlighting the background using that formatting rule um, where we need to add the fields. And we have a, a section on top where we're actually showing what needs to be filled out. Uh, so basically, um, when they click on submit, we highlight, we, we basically show them that they don't have, the fields aren't filled out yet, and we prevent them from actually submitting the form. So that's what we did in 3.2. We didn't have support for validation, but now in 4.1 we do, and the validation UI, um, there is still some UI required, but you don't have to change the rules. The rules work as is. Um, you do get support for these new commands. We'll talk more about those in a second. And let's take a quick look at an example. So here's a test form in the designer, and if I, if I select the name field, you'll see that we have this one validation rule here on the right. The validation rules have the uh, exclamation mark next to them, and that, that tells you that's a validation rule. We also have a formatting rule here called to highlight the field uh, if it's, if it's uh, invalid. 
And importantly, what we're doing is we're actually adding these, um, these buttons down below to get the count of the errors. So let's take a look at this in the browser. So this is our test version of Forms Viewer. So this will be going live hopefully by the end of this month or maybe the first week in June. We, we finally finished all of the feature work and we are entering our final test pass. We've actually been testing all, the, all along um, and we're very happy to, to finally be releasing 4.1. Um, so this form hasn't been filled out, so I've got some errors I need to fix. And you can see that what we're doing is we're, we're not actually running the validation logic or, or showing these validation errors until we click the buttons. Now, why are we doing that? Well, when, when we implement the validation logic, some of these forms can be quite hefty. I mean, you can have a form with hundreds or thousands even of fields in it. And for performance reasons, we decided to, uh, for the first version of this, to only allow you to run the validation logic when uh, you click on a button or do some action. Uh, you could actually put it on a field as an action when they tab out, but it's not automatic. And um, you know, once again, that, that's because we want the forms to, to be snappy. We want our forms, we don't have, want to have to pay any kind of performance penalty. And the way the validation works is it's, it can be, it can be uh, uh, quite extensive sometimes if you have a lot of validation logic. So, um, so that's one thing that you'll have to do is you'll have to actually add the error can the get errors uh, to a button, to your submit button or to a save button. And um, so here you see we've got five validation errors. If I type in my name and click get the error count, you can see that the number goes down and the number of errors goes down. If I type in the wrong um, validation for an email, uh, I still have an issue with the email, but if I type it incorrectly, um, you can see that goes away. And you can see I have a conditional formatting on the, on the field as well, and they have the validation. Um, so this is a quick example of these validation rules working with these buttons. Now let's take a look at the button. Joanne's going to be showing you how to add this to your form in a second. But you can see here that we are uh, using a conditional, we're using a centralized logic, which is the best practice. So we're actually uh, running um, this get errors command. Uh, when you have, uh, when you add this, we have a, actually a reusable XML template part that you can add to your forms to quickly add validation, uh, this, these validation commands um, and the, the section to show the validation errors. So it makes it easy for you to add this to an existing form. Um, the best practice is always to centralize the logic. And here you can see we've, we're sending all of the get error requests through this get error node underneath actions in the XTPs uh, fields. Now, th that's really good because that means you can copy the, the validation to any button in your form. You might have several different views, you might have several different um, save buttons or submit buttons, and um, you'll want to copy that. And so it's very easy to do that because you can just set that node and, and the, the rules actually run underneath it. So the command that we're using here is the new get errors command. And you can see that we've got some different options to this command, um, no validate equals false. So no validate equals false means that we can rerun the command and, um, and actually skip the validation if we want. Um, and I'll, I'll, Joanna will talk more about that in a second. In fact, I'm trying to understand exactly the best way to explain that, that option to you. But um, it, it'll be in the, actually we can go to the, uh, we can go to Forms here, we can find out. So let's take a look at the new design options. So the first step when you upload your forms is obviously to inject them with QRules if you haven't already. And then if we search for the get errors command here, you'll see that we do have now, um, we do have explanation for these uh, parameters, hopefully. So, um, so this basically, this says it prevents this command from revalidating the forms fields. So rather than run through the entire validation again, you can just get the errors that were uh, resulted from the last one. So you obviously need to run um, the no validation. Um, we, actually, I'm trying to explain this to Anne. Maybe you can explain this better than I can. But the uh, no validate equals false. If they haven't run the validation first, then that won't matter, right? It, it only happens, it, it's only a valid if they've run it before, right? Yes, that's right. That's a simplest explanation to that, Patrick. 
So it's a little confusing because if, if you specify false, the very first time it's always going to run it anyway. But the benefit of this is that the next time it runs, um, I, don't, I guess I still don't understand it, Joanna, because I guess we would want to run it each time in order to update it. So I'm still confused by that parameter. We'll have to ask Jimmy about that. So you guys can just ignore that for now. Um, but you can see here that um, for other fields like the number field, uh, we've got this uh, um, two validation rules here. We don't we don't want to be blank. We also don't want to be not not a number. Um, and, and there's a couple of different ways to do this. Obviously, um, you can use a pattern like we're doing for the email. So here you can see um, we have a rule pattern. And there's a lot of different custom patterns that you can add to your forms for validation. Here we're showing a regular expression matching an email. And you can select a couple of the standard patterns. There's only five of them up above. Or you can design your custom pattern. In this case, we've actually, we're not using the, the out-of-box email one. We're using the custom pattern. And so, so the validation logic will, will run and will do the, map, the pattern matching as well um, to validate it uh, with the condition there. So that's a quick demo and explanation. Um, the, and I'm going to switch, I think, now to Joanne. And she's going to show you how you can easily add it to your existing forms. Any questions so far? So one one thing that there are a couple more points I think I need to make here. One is that the best practice when you're when you have a button on your form that's submitting it is to include a save button. So in in InfoPath, if you have required fields, you can't actually submit the form um, unless you have fixed those required fields. And required fields are slightly different than validation rules. So required fields are um, are a schema or a data source validation. So in the data source, if you have a field, you can say it cannot be blank. And if you have a submit button in the form that's submitting the form and that field is blank, InfoPath will say you can't submit it. So this is a problem because a lot of customers will have save buttons and they're doing a submit behind it. So they're doing a submit with their save button because they want to give their users the ability to partially save a form. So they have a save button um, and a submit button. The difference would be, say, it would just save it and submit would actually set a flag so that the workflow would kick off and the next person could actually review the document, right? Well, unfortunately, because save was using submit, they couldn't do it um, because submit would not allow them to submit a form if a field was blank. So we implemented these three rules, these clear errors, get errors, and get error count to work around that limitation in InfoPath. And those rules have been in Q rules, the, the plugin, probably for at least 10 years, um, probably since the early days, because we wanted to give users that ability to save the data if they're like they're really busy and they don't want to, they don't have all the, they don't have time to fill out the form. They hit the save button, it submits it to the library in a saved state, right? So it's not actually kicking the workflow. Uh, but in order to do that, you had to be able to clear the errors, and that's why those commands, clear errors and get errors and get error count, were implemented in Q rules many many years ago. Um, is just that scenario, which is allow them to save it using the submit logic using a, a, an action rule that had a submit on it, right? Um, so now we finally implemented those features. So now you can actually have forms that save. But in, in Forms Viewer's case, we never, ever we never ever prevented you from submitting a form if there was a blank field. And we still don't. We still allow you to do that. Um, so if you want to prevent them from submitting it, um, and you have a required field in the form, you will need to add an action rule like we do have um, with the validation, and you will have to um, you will have to basically use a workaround still. So what we're shipping in 4.1 is support for the validation rules, but not support for the required fields. I hope that makes sense. Um, it's very easy to work around this. Um, and in fact, in some ways, you might claim that it's better to allow them to submit it without having to do extra logic best practice um, and it's better to actually display the errors in the form uh, because a lot of times if the form is really long you, the user has a hard time finding where the error is they have to search around and 
And um, so it's better to have this, this kind of error message near, near the place where they're trying to submit it. Okay, so we're going to do a quick demo here, and we'll show you how to add the uh, validation to an existing form. And it's really quite easy. Uh, Joanne, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Can you make me presenter? Yep. Okay, so for this webinar, we are including the XTP that Patrick just showed you in the slides. And uh, we're also including a how-to guide. So um, this serves as uh, simple instructions on how you can inject the XTP to your forms. So the first step is to inject Q rules into your form using your forms viewer. But if you already have Q rules in your form, you may skip this section already. But if you don't have, let me show you how to do that. So let me just upload a new template. A blank form that has no Q rules in it. Okay, and then click the sign. And then you'll see here that it just detected that your form doesn't have curls in it. So you can just go ahead and click inject curls. Then curls injected successfully, click OK. Then go back to the form template, upload templates page, and then download your form. And now you'll see that you have Q rules in your form. This is the Q rules, cadaver rules, as uh, added as a secondary data source in your form. So uh, let me add now the, the XTP. So click on the controls ribbon here and select add or remove custom controls. Click add and Leave that to template part, and then browse to the validation XTP template part. Okay. So the XTP is now in this form template, but we're still to add that in our main data source. And uh, the part of that document is here. We've already done that. This is just to clarify. Um... Mm -hmm. Joanne, I just want to let or tell people that there's there's a two step here. What Joanne's doing is she's adding the um, XTP to the designer first. So you have to actually add the, the new control to the designer. And then once you've, it's in the designer, um, you can just add it to all of your forms. So you don't have to do this for every form, just your, just once uh, when you add the controls. And then after that, um, you'll, you'll just add it to each form separately. Thanks. All right. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. OK. So once you've added the template part in your form, um, there's just a, a quick reminder here that you need to create a backup of your form because the XTP will change the schema of the form as it injects its own data source into the template. So you also want to avoid adding the XTP control multiple times because it will create duplicate fields in your data source. So once you've created that backup, um, let's now click the validation XTP here, and it will inject the schema to your form. So this is the validation XTP. Now, uh, the next steps is to edit the rules. You will need to replace Replace the at temp command and at temp result instances to point to your cadaver rules command and result nodes. So those commands are in this fields. Select get errors, get error count, and clear errors. So let's go to manage rules and then click this get error rule here. And you'll see 
that uh, they have actions that is setting a temp command field and temp result. So whenever you see this field, temp command and temp, your temp result, you'll just need to replace that with the actual command and result fields in the cadaver rules secondary data source. So let's just... Mm -hmm. While you're doing that, Joanne, I'm gonna quickly explain mm -hmm. why we have these placeholders. The, uh, the, the XML template part is a reusable section. It's a kind of a, a nice feature that most people aren't aware of. And some of you may be seeing this for the first time. It, it is useful because the template part can actually include the view. It can include a few fields. It can, it can include a data connection. And more, most importantly for this example, it can include rules. And so you kind of can do all of that with one injection. You don't actually need to remember all the rules and for, for very complex things like when we do a, an example of text messaging somebody with Twilio, there's a lot of steps involved. And so, Joanne, go ahead and, and, and change these out while I'm, I'm talking if you want. Yeah. You need to have a placeholder for Q rules. The, 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 the reason why we have placeholders is because the XML template parts have some limitations. One of those limitations is that they they can't work with um, with a a plugin and Curls is a plugin. So what we've done here is we've just added a temp uh, field that you just replace. It makes it really easy to update it. And once you're done, once once Joanne's done with this, she'll just run it and it'll all be reconnected to Curls. So th there are some limitations with the XML template parts, but in general they're really easy to use. One other limitation I think Joanne mentioned earlier was that you you want to make sure you don't add the, the template part twice. Um, so in this case, you've got a final template part. We've done it for you, uh, so you don't have to worry about that. Joanne? Okay, so I've just replaced them all. And saving my form template. And re-uploading it in Forms Viewer. Oh, <laughs> I think I've added that. The XTP above the, the header, let me just fix that. It's a demo we have a, a bump in the road. This is a great example of, of how fast it is to upload forms and forms here and, and make changes. Just a complete night and day experience from uh, when we used to be able to publish an input path and it took forever to publish. Joanne? Okay. So this can be still be fixed, but anyway, uh, so first let's just leave leave all fields blank and Let's see how the form count the errors. So it found five errors there because I made them all required fields. So let's see the details. Uh, click get errors. Okay, now you'll see the field that has errors in it and the details. So it says name, please enter a name, and email address, etc. So if I add my name, it will remove that highlight. And then let's just repeat the error count again. It's down to four now, and it will reduce the errors as we fix uh, the errors in the fields. Quick question, Gwen, for you is these, uh, the error text, the details, that's coming from your validation rule, right? This uh, field and detail, it, it comes from the uh, the parameter in the get error. Uh, let me quickly show you how that is done here. This format says field and message. So it will show the field that has error in it and the message that you're showing. And that mes message will come from the validation rule here, this screen tip here. Great. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Thanks. 
are there other options for it? You can just return the, the message, right? You don't have to return the field. Yes, just, uh, you don't have to re return the field, just message. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. You got a different language, and you don't want the dash, for example. I guess the dash is something that we're adding between the field and the message, but if you just have the message, it wouldn't return the, the dash, right? It would just return the please select the date or the please enter a phone number, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's about it. <laughs> you can also yes, clear errors. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, do, do, this is great, Joanne. I, I guess the, the question people, most people have probably are, okay, well, this is great for the XML template part, but what about my existing validation? You know, what, what should I do? And, and I think the answer is that you've got the rules there, so you just basically want to copy the rules from the buttons, of course, the validation XCP, you can delete the fields, you can hide them, but the idea is that you copy the, the validation command, the get errors command, to your submit button in your form, and then you would change this uh, error section, you would copy it from the XTP to a place in your form near your, your submit button, so you can, they can see the errors when they hit the submit command. And you'd want, want to obviously prevent them from submitting the document if they had validation errors. Is that right? Yes, that's correct, Patrick. So let's go, I know we're running a little bit over. I'm gonna um, share out my slides again and we'll do a quick Q&A. Okay, so um, thanks again for coming to our webinar today. We are uh, happy to announce uh, that we're very close to shipping 4.1 of Forms Viewer, and uh, it looks like we have uh, Pete saying that he's going to leave. Thanks, Pete, for being here. And um, I think we've got um, a couple more things to mention here at the end. Uh, we've been working on Forms Viewer for many years. In fact, we started working on it, I think, five years ago, if I'm not mistaken. We, uh, when Microsoft announced that InfoPath was being deprecated in January of 2014, um, we actually had been working on Forms Viewer for three or four months before they announced that because we had gotten early warning from them that they were discontinuing InfoPath. So the main the main goal of Informs Viewer was to provide our customers, um, we've served thousands of customers over the years, with a low cost option for keeping that forms investment going. And so that's the first real goal here is to, you know, this we're the only ones that have this zero to minimal effort migration path out there today for Forms Viewer for InfoPath forms. If you have an InfoPath form and you want to move it to the future, um, you know, you could move it to Power Apps, but you have to rewrite it. You have to learn Power Apps. You have to train your users, and you have to pay Microsoft licensing fees. With Forms Viewer, you can take that existing form, you can upgrade it, and um, continue using it without paying Microsoft additional fees. And um, you, you know, there's a very low cost structure. It's based on the tenant. If you're in 365, if you're on prem, um, there's a one uh, license cost. If you if you were smart enough to get Form zero before we, uh, you know, started the, the on-prem pricing. You've got a free license forever. Uh, we did start charging for that on-prem license um, in April of this year, uh, but it's really low cost. So the, the goal here is uh, not to be per user or, um, or, or if you're on-prem, you don't have usage. It's not usage related either. It's just one, one fee for the whole year. If you're on online, there's a usage. Is based on usage, so it's as low as you know, 90 bucks a month, um, you know, and it goes up to like I think three or four times that for the unlimited option. Um, so, so we also added all these new features. So, in addition to adding the support for Q rules, which include 60 or 70 different commands, uh, we've added support for CSS for extending the forms with JavaScript for um, adding new web service calls that use REST submits to your form so that you can actually integrate with 
new um, technologies that are out there today, like like I mentioned SMS earlier. Um, we've done a lot of we've done a lot of webinars on those integrations, DocuSign, Twilio, Google Image API. We're going to be focusing this year on the assistant, so allowing you to quickly approve a form. You know, if you get a form in the mail, you can actually talk to the assistant on your phone without having to use your fingers. So that's our next, our, our kind of killer demo this year we're working on. And we'll be in, integrating new features in forms here to allow you to do that based on certain templates. So we'll, you'll have a template so you can talk to, you can basically have dialogues that you present to the user um, and you can customize it. But it will be for simple scenarios. It won't be to fill out a form from scratch. Uh, so, and then of course, the, the third reason to, to look at Forms here is uh, Cadaver support. So we're here for you. We're very responsive, um, and we will help you <laughs> with your with your migration process. Uh, any any more questions? I want to thank you all for being here today. We uh, will get this webinar up on YouTube and provide the the kit. You'll get the how-to document that Joanne demonstrated. You'll get the XML template part to make it easy. And if you need any help whatsoever, we'll give you a free hour of support to help you with this for the first 10 people or so that, that decide to, to ask us for help on this. But it really shouldn't be that hard. It should be pretty simple. Um, I guess that's it. Thanks, Joanne. You did an awesome job. And uh, hope to have you here next week. We're going to be talking more about Forms Viewer features in 4.1. We'll be looking at uh, the um, format date command and others. So hope you have a great day. Take care. Thanks. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, everyone.